Okay, good evening everybody. We want to start our short session. This few minutes that we sit together is uh, most precious moment because we <coughs> make our minds clear, clean, peaceful. And also we want to wish the same clear, pure, peaceful state of mind for all other living beings, particularly those who are thousands upon thousands of those who are unnecessarily suffering at this moment for their comfort and peace and happiness, we all want to practice our metta and wish them all peace and happiness. And they are in great stress, pain and uh, almost despair. So we want to wish them somehow peace, solace and comfort. As we mentioned in the morning, let all of them on, in all 10 directions be well, happy and peaceful. May their hearts and minds charge with the thoughts of loving friendliness peace and happiness and may they feel comfort, relief from their suffering. We want to see that very soon they all come back to normal state and get back to their regular life. And also we wish those who are doing, sacrificing their life doing great research, medical uh, professionals, scientists, chemists will come up with a solution very quickly, some kind of uh, antiviral medicine to one thing to prevent it and the other is to eliminate from patients' bodies and eliminate this virus from Earth forever. May they come up with such a solution to relieve the suffering beings in the world. And all those who take care of them, all medical professionals, doctors, nurses, and their supporters, ambulance service, service, service people, hospitals, and wherever they are, let them be very healthy to support these suffering beings and then they can do their job more efficiently and proficiently. So these are our very sincere metta thought for both patients and their uh, health givers or caregivers. <clears throat> and at the same time, we must understand that everything is impermanent, including this COVID-19, all impermanent. One day, sooner or later, it disappears, fades out of, fades out of this earth, fades out, disappears. Just like everything else in the world, every condition things is subject to change. So we can see that in miniature form, what is happening in the, in the whole universe is happening to us while we are sitting on our cushion in this quiet moment. That is, we are changing. 
our breath is changing, our feelings are changing, our perception is changing, thoughts are changing, everything that we call ours is changing, inside and out. So we see that happening, we cannot see them all with our open eyes, nor can we see them in closed eyes, but we can feel this happening to our breath. Inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling, repeat again and again and again, because each breath is impermanent. Each breath appears and disappears, just like anything else, appear and disappear. This appearance and disappearance we can feel somewhere in our body. The chest, abdomen, tip of the nose, nostrils or upper lips or inside the nose, between eyes, or somewhere, wherever you feel this touch strongly, there you pay attention. When you pay attention, you definitely will notice how quickly all these disappear. And then that gives us a degree of maturity, understanding and wisdom to know the nature of existence. The whole existence is just moving, changing, flowing, like, like a river, never stopping even a fraction of a second, changing. And then when we have this understanding, mature understanding, then nothing can make us unhappy, nothing can shake us up, we remain quiet, peaceful, in an equanimous state of mind. And then we gain some degree of concentration. By the way, if you remember the Noble Eightfold Path, number seven is mindfulness, number eight is concentration. So mindfulness leads to concentration. And, some, and then concentration leads to mindfulness and wisdom. So it goes to the first category of the Noble Eightfold Path called right understanding. That arises from concentration. So mindfulness leads to concentration Concentration leads to wisdom or understanding. That is why Buddha said concentrated mind can see things exactly as they are. That is our goal. Whenever we say as they are, we mean the impermanence of everything. Every part of our body, every aggregate is changing, impermanent. So please keep this in mind and start focusing your breath and follow these short instructions for the next few minutes.
There is no concentration without wisdom, no wisdom without concentration. One who has both wisdom and concentration is close to peace and emancipation. Okay, friends, if you have any question, please ask now. Bhante, I have a question. Yeah. Can we do the discussion through this method? What? Your Sutta discussion class, you, your Sutta discussion class, we, uh, we can do this way, right? Yeah, you can ask questions now, yes. You have a question now? If you want to have a question. Naika Hamdunne, you are... Yes? Naika Hamdunne, you are Sutta discussion class. Usually you do, do it on Saturdays. So did you start that class? Then if you start, we can we can do it uh, do it in this way. Then I also can join. Sutta discussion on Saturday? Tomorrow? Do you do you have that class? Did you start it already? No, 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 no. We have, we have not started that class. Uh, that is uh, okay. not on uh, Zoom. It is in the dining hall, and I meet people yeah. uh, in person and have a discussion. But Saturday. Until this uh, unfortunate uh, period is over, I cannot hold the class because people cannot come here. Our place is completely yeah. closed to the public. So that is why I started this one to meet people and ask people to ask me questions. Okay? Okay. Right. Okay, so Bhante, I have a question. Yeah, he has a question. What is that? All right, so the question is, how do we use the five aggregates to develop an understanding of anicca, of impermanence? You heard the question. How do we use the five aggregates, uh, meditate on five aggregates to understand uh, impermanent. Okay, in uh, this short period you focus your mind on the breathing. The breath is called body, breath body. And also breath is called body conditioner. It is called body conditioner because it conditions our body by bringing oxygen. Without oxygen, we cannot live. And therefore, depending on the degree of oxygen, our body functions, bodily functions change. And therefore, uh, this breath is called the body or first aggregate. All that has hardness, softness, occupying space are called body. That changes all the time. Breathing changes, heartbeat changes, and so forth, all this change. And then second is feeling aggregate. Feeling, all kind of feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral uh, feelings, also change every moment. 
then our perception also changes. Perception of anything changes as it arises. And then the thought, we experience our thought arising and passing away. And then our uh, mind and consciousness also coming and going, appearing and disappearing, changing much faster than anything else. So, in the breath we have the body, in the breath we have feelings because we feel when we breathe, we perceive the breath mentally and then we have intention to breathe, that is, that belongs to the aggregates of volitional formations and then consciousness. We have to be conscious of our breathing. That belongs to consciousness aggregate. So these are the five aggregates that we experience every time we breathe in and breathe out. It is very subtle. Otherwise, you have no way to know aggregates. Feeling is aggregate. Perception is aggregate. Belong to the aggregate category because there are groups. Feeling is not one, several feelings. Therefore, it is a group. And therefore, it is an aggregate. Like that, all aggregates are changing every moment we practice meditation. This, this is, as I mentioned at certain point, seeing impermanence is the heart of Vipassana meditation. Without seeing impermanence, we can never make progress in Vipassana meditation. And therefore, this is how we use the five aggregate to develop our insight meditation or Vipassana meditation. To answer your question. Thank you, Bhante. You're welcome. Any other question from your home? Mm. Ah, uh, Judy asks, I uh, Bhante, would you please? Uh, Bhante? Uh, Yes. You want to ask Judy or should I read it? Oh, uh, yes. Just could you speak briefly about sharing merit? Okay. Sharing merits is also a way of expressing our loving friendliness. We do something very wholesome. And when we do something wholesome, we feel very peaceful and happy. And we want others also have to have the same peacefulness and happiness. For example, suppose when you are uh, driving, you come across a, a little puppy uh, trying to cross the road and it is a very busy street. You stop, stop the traffic, pick up the puppy, and bring home or whatever you do, give to uh, animal, uh, what do you call, a, uh, protecting agency or something. And then you come and tell me, Bhante, I did such and such today. You tell me that with full of thrill and happiness and joy, I say to you, oh, this is wonderful. I share your marriage. So you do something good and tell other person that, then that person also becomes happy. This is how we share merits. Also, there is another, even a subtler way of sharing merits. We normally do in Buddhist countries when somebody passes away. Uh, in his or her memory, people do various meritorious deeds. Primarily, they give dana. Uh, dana to monks, nuns, uh, beggars, and hospitals, and so forth. Wherever they like to give dana, they give it, and then by giving, they become very happy. Actually, the giver enjoys the gift more than the recipients. And therefore, you, after giving, 
uh, something, food or lodging or whatever, to somebody, at that time you are very happy and peaceful, then you wish, may my departed relative also be well, happy and peaceful, just like I am. This We don't know whether the other person has received or not, but in our mind, we feel that we have fulfilled very beautiful duty that share our own well, uh, I mean, good thoughts, peace, and uh, joy with them. This is how we share merits. The sharing merits, in fact, is the way of uh, expressing our generosity as well as our loving friendliness. So in both ways, we uh, get more merits. Merits in Buddhist terminology, merits mean that which we do to make us happy. The things that we do to make us happy is called merits. How many things we do to make ourselves happy? We throw parties, we go on picnic, we go, uh, we marry, we earn wealth, and we find a good job. All this uh, we do to make us happy. Are we really happy from all those things? Not necessarily. <laughs> we sometimes end up with unhappiness. Why? We don't do all these things with uh, selflessly. We do all other things expecting something in return. Only thing that brings merits is that which we do without expecting anything in return. Mm. That is called meritorious deeds, mm. the thing that brings us happiness. Others also bring relative, relatively happiness, but they are not bringing us real happiness because eventually we will be disappointed. For instance, you invite a friend to your house for dinner. One, two, three, four times. Expecting your friend also to invite you for a dinner or lunch. Suppose that person does not invite you even once, then you will think, I have invited this person five times. He never invited me. So this kind of uh, motive, you share your wealth to somebody. But when you give dana, you don't expect anything from return. And that is why dana brings you real happiness. And that is the happiness, you know, many people, donate anonymously. In their heart, they feel very, very good that nobody knows that that person made the donation. So that person is very happy because that person does not expect anything in return. And that is what is called marriage in Buddhism. And that is the kind of feeling we share with others. Okay. Anybody has any other question? Thank you. Huh? No. Well, if you don't have any question, uh, I thank you once again. Uh, I have one, one quick question. Yeah? I, can, I can ask you that. Yeah, I, I, want to, I have one quick question, okay, if it's not too long. Um, I was just looking and studying again Anapanasati Sutta. And uh, one thing I wanted to have some clarification at the beginning of 
the Sutta, the Buddha says, um, Rasamba, um, he starts by saying Tipajanati, and then after a while he changes and says um, Tisikati, when he says uh, Sabakayam Patisam Vedi, and then uh, Asasisami Tisikati, which is uh, trains thus, as I understand it. But then he says, um, um, passes, uh, pasam bayam, kayasam, the breath, but it seems like it's some effort uh, in the sutta. He's explaining, uh, training thus. At first, um, my, understand, my understanding is sabha, um, sabha kaya patisam vedi, meaning um, we feel the entire breath body from the beginning to the end that should be spontaneous it's not something that we trained for well uh, i think your voice was not coming very clearly if i understood the part i heard clearly what have you been in one place you heard Sabda Kaya Parishan Vedi uh, Asasi Sami Zikati Pasa Sami Zikati Then Pasambhaan Kaya Sankarang Asasi Sami Zikati Pasi Sami Zikati Sabda Kaya means entire breath body Some people interpret as entire physical body uh, but in the sutta itself uh, mentioned asasa pasasa ko anyataran kayo that is inhaling and exhaling is one of the bodies it is this body that we become fully aware of then pasam bhayam kaya sankaram kaya sankara as i mentioned is the breath, body conditioner. Body conditioner is the breath. Pasamba means tranquilizing or tranquilizing. Tranquilizing is not uh, doing deliberately or intentionally or uh, doing something with great effort. Tra body, tra body becomes relaxed peaceful and uh, what do you call pliable. Uh, that happens, sabha kaya means breath body. I mentioned this several times, when you pay total mindful attention to the breath without letting mind wander here and there, then the uh, wandering mind uh, slowly uh, disappear and then your mind remains on the breath so you notice the beginning, middle and end of each breath as you do it with oh, that is what you do deliberately just paying mindful attention to the breath that is attention without greed, hatred or delusion Clear, pure breath itself be your object. As you keep paying attention to it and noticing rising and falling, appearing and disappearing, slowly, 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 your breath becomes subtler and subtler and subtler and then become very, very calm. So that entire breathing process becomes very calm, relaxed. That is called tranquilizing the body. It tranquilizes by itself by you are paying attention and breathing in and out, but you don't do anything particularly to make it tranquil. It must happen naturally. Anytime you make up an effort to tranquilize, then it get agitated, you get agitated, excited, thrilled and so forth. 
tranquility will completely disappear. And therefore, let that happen slowly and naturally uh, so that you experience tranquility. Passam by means tranquilize. I, I, I think it is difficult to use the word tranquilize because these days we all know how we tranquilize animals and uh, people and so forth with uh, injecting, injecting you know, chemicals. What called some gas? Uh, uh, what is that? Uh, anesthetic. An anesthetic. Anesthetic. Uh, so, therefore, we don't do that kind of uh, intentional uh, or artificial tranquilizing. But this is the another thing, beauty of meditation that. If we don't dissipate our mind or don't uh, agitate our mind and uh, uh, make it calm, relaxed and peaceful, then this tranquility will tranquility arises in the mind. That is why I mentioned several times that we should not use words. Words are always obstruct the mind from seeing the reality. That is, uh, it words get in between the reality and mind. Therefore, we remove the middle agent called words, concepts, ideas, theories, we remove them and use the mind to experience or to see things exactly as they really are. You can never see anything exactly as they are when we use words. Remember, this is very important uh, in uh, practicing Vipassana meditation in order to see Things, that things means five aggregates, body, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness. These are the things that we see. You always hear the word, uh, the phrase, seeing things as they really are. Things here means body, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness. Nothing else. And seeing is seeing with wisdom eye. That is, they all are rising and falling, rising and falling, rising and falling, altering what is in between. Rises, alters and fall. Rises, alters and fall. Rises, alters and fall. There is no uh, any fixation, any, any static moment. It is it continuously moving in a state of flux. That is the good word, flux. And this flux you cannot see if you use words, theories, because words can excite the mind, stimulate the mind. Theories can stimulate the mind. When mind is stimulated, it becomes more and more uh, agitated and bring more and more ideas, words, concepts, and so forth, you will caught up in this jargon of concept. This is called conceptual proliferation. There are physical proliferation and conceptual proliferation. Physical pro proliferation start in the mother's womb. <laughs> conceptual proliferation is after birth. As, as soon as begin to, you begin to think, conceptual proliferation start. And therefore, to avoid this conceptual proliferation, to gain real, deep wisdom, tranquility, peace, we eliminate those words and pay attention to what 
is happening to see it exactly as it is. So the word tranquility is something that happens naturally. I think, friends, this may be enough for tonight. It's getting close to 8 o'clock. And thank you very much for coming. And I hope to see you tomorrow morning. Good night. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah. Good night, Bonte. Good night, Bonte. Thank you, 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 Bonte.